I just saw it up there if you want. Can't be sad. As uh, hopefully you noticed in the bulletin, there are going to be uh, two parts to the uh, message uh, today. After my presentation on the Tin Horn, since this is the first Sabbath of the new year, we're going to uh, just take a few minutes for anyone that would like to offer up a word of uh, praise and thanksgiving for the Lord blessing us to uh, make it through the year 2019. Amen? Amen? So we'll have that opportunity at the end of the message. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we open God's word. Our Father, oh Lord, we thank you once again for this opportunity to come to share this message on the book of Daniel. We pray that as we continue to walk through these prophecies that you will give us understanding from on high, that you'll send your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts, our words that are spoken this day, O oh Lord, that they be pleasing in thy sight and that we can see clearly that your return is near. Help us to prepare and also to prepare others for your soon coming, we pray, for your imminent return, we ask. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. 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 So with that, let's uh, turn in our Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter 7. And I've been going through uh, Daniel chapter 7 today. But we've been going through the book of Daniel chapter 7 uh, in detail so that we can understand the uh, beast powers that we've uh, studied, the, the lion, the, uh, the bear, the leopard, and the dreadful and terrible beast, as Daniel mentions. And we've been sort of going through these, uh, you know, combing through scripture by scripture so that, as the Lord said, we would not be deceived when it comes to interpretation of prophecy. We talked about this in the Sabbath school lesson today, how important it is that we understand that Christ is in the midst of these prophecies, revealing to us these truths uh, so that we may prepare for his soon return. He also said in Matthew 24, 24, if you want to keep your hand there in Daniel, and turn over to Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. He, he uh, gave us a warning there. Matthew chapter 24, and verse 24. If you have it, it, it says, Therefore, there shall arise what? False Christ. False Christ. And false what? Uh, false prophets. So the Lord is saying there are going to be some people out there that are going to be interpreting these scriptures of Daniel chapter 7 and other places, and they're going to be doing it correctly. Falsely. He said falsely. They're going to be false prophets, and they're going to be taking these things out of context, and they're going to be giving them meanings that totally go against the word of God. He said, there are going to be false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive who? The very elect. The very elect. Those that God called to be part of his kingdom, he's saying Satan has those out there that are false Christs and false prophets and their intention is to do what? To deceive to deceive us. They want to tell us that Babylon is not the lion kingdom that we've been seeing in prophecy. They want to let us know that Medo-Persia is not the bear kingdom and that Grecia is not the leopard kingdom. They want to give these things different names. They want to call them Russia. They want to call it England. They want to give it other uh, names of different countries to these kingdoms that we clearly see are represented in scripture. As a matter of fact, we've looked at the scriptures that told us clearly what these nations, what these kingdoms uh, represented and who they would be. Did we not? We looked at scripture that clearly said Babylon 
was the Lion Kingdom, and that Medo-Persia was the bear, and Grecia, and so forth, and so on. So it should be clear in our minds that we will not be deceived, as Christ said, that these things, if we apply scripture to scripture, here a little, and there a little, we will find the answer to these questions. No doubt we will find the truth behind these scriptures. And as we continue on today, we've uh, looked at these kingdoms. We, we determined that Babylon was the head of gold, did we not? And that it reigned from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. We determined that Medo-Persia was the chest and arms of silver. And notice that we're comparing two different chapters of the book of Daniel here. We're looking at Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Uh, Elder Tim talked this morning in Sabbath school how prophecy, when it is revealed in one place and shared in another, there's a repeat and enlarged principle, is there not? In one place we're giving a little bit of truth, and in another place we're giving more truth so that we can understand better what the Lord's intentions were for us in preparation for his return. Amen? Also, we saw that Grisha was the belly and thighs of brass in Daniel 2, and in Daniel 7, Grisha was the leopard kingdom that reigned from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. And the last one that we're focusing on here now is that pagan Roman uh, power, which were the legs of iron, which Daniel called in Daniel 7:7 7, 7, the dreadful and terrible beast. And we know that it started its reign in 168 B.C. I shared with you Revelation chapter 12, if you can turn over there, and verse 13, uh, a clear scripture that indicates that it is pagan Rome that was in control of the world since 168 B.C., up and through the time of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says there, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 13, it says there, and, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he did what? He persecuted the woman. And we know the woman represents the church, does it not? Yes. And in this case, we know this woman represents Christ's true church. That Satan, in some form, in some fashion, would persecute Christ's true and faithful. Which in this church brought forth the man-child. And who is that man-child? Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. So Satan would in some sense, in some way, persecute God's true church that brought forth Jesus Christ. And so we know that Satan uh, of himself did not persecute God's church, but he used human beings, didn't he? He used the pagan Roman Empire to persecute God's people. And so we must understand as we turn back over to Daniel, how Satan went about persecuting God's people, how he went about killing them and devouring them, as it was said of this dreadful and terrible beast in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7, And I saw in the night vision, behold, a fourth beast, beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and he had what great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was what? Diverse from other beasts uh, that were before it, and it had ten horns. We talked about this dreadful and terrible beast and how he would do great damage to the work of, of, of uh, spreading the gospel throughout the world. How under Nero, the persecution would begin with Paul and Peter being brought before him to give a witness of their faith in Christ. And regardless of that witness, Nero still put them before the axemen to, to be put to death because he did not want to hear about this Jesus Christ, about this Christianity. And so he started the first persecution of Christians in efforts to destroy Christianity. And so we're told also that this kingdom, according to Daniel 7.7, 7, would come upon the scene of uh, prophecy in two parts. Daniel said in Daniel 7, he first saw the dreadful and terrible beast, amen? Yeah. 
But what did he see later? He said at the end of verse 7 that I saw what? I saw ten horns. And so this lets us know that this kingdom of uh, Rome will in some way come upon the scene of Earth's history in two, two phases. It would be pagan, and then there would be another phase. And we are working our way to revealing that other phase, but we want to see what the Bible has to say. We know what it is, but what does the Bible say to help us share this with others around us so that they can clearly see that there are two phases to this kingdom? When we go back and look at Babylon, was Babylon in two phases? No, it was just one, it was just a lion kingdom, right? What about Medo-Persia? No, just one phase. It was just a bear kingdom. Uh, what about Grisha? No, just one. It had four heads on the leopard, right? But that didn't mean that that kingdom came in two parts. But here we find this dreadful and terrible one, the one with the iron teeth and the nails of brass, Daniel said, will come on the scene in two phases. We saw the last phase in the last presentation where pagan Rome would rise to power and eventually corrupt the world and persecute Christians. But Daniel said there's another phase of this kingdom. And, and what I want to do now is just look at a couple of scriptures. If you look at Daniel 2.33, 2, there are scriptures in the Bible that clearly reveal to us the idea of the two phases of the Roman kingdom. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 33, it says there, and its legs of what? And its feet partly of iron and partly of what? So is that not two phases? We have the legs of iron, and then we have the feet of part iron and part clay. Amen? What about Daniel 8.13? Daniel 8.13, he says there, And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? And sacrifice is an added word there. So how long is the vision concerning the daily and the what? The transgression of desolation. To give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So Daniel says, this kingdom, this dreadful and terrible kingdom is going to come on the scene in two parts. It's going to come on as the daily first, and then it's going to reveal itself as what he calls the transgression of desolation. So let's go to another scripture. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. As a matter of fact, I want to turn over there. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 7. And this is verse 7 we're going to read. And then we're going to read another scripture in uh, 2 Thessalonians. But it says here, For the mystery of iniquity, there is one, doeth already work, only he, he who would now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. So we have the mystery of iniquity that wants to do a particular work. But Paul says he can't do his work until someone or some entity is what? Taken out of the way. And so who is it that must be taken out of the way so that the mystery of iniquity can work? Who is it must be taken out of the way so that the transgression of desolation can do its work? Rome, this kingdom, the Bible is clearly showing us has two phases. It has the iron kingdom phase, and then it has the phase of the iron mixed with clay. And Paul understood this, and he revealed this to the Thessalonians. While you're there in 2 Thessalonians, look at verse 3 of the same chapter 2. In verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, Paul says there, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come what? Of falling away first, and that man of sin be what? Revealed the son of perdition. So Paul, once again, is saying that this Roman kingdom comes in how many parts? Two parts. 
He says the man of sin must be revealed, but he says what must happen first? There must be a falling away. Who has to fall away? Paganism has to be taken out of the way. And one other scripture that I didn't add in on the slides, turn over to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at verse 2. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. So hopefully we've seen in the Old Testament and the New Testament clearly the idea that this, this fourth kingdom, this dreadful and terrible one, would reveal itself in two phases. And even John understood this in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2, where he says, for verse, uh, yes, verse 3, where he says there, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, Speaking of the of the of the man of sin, yeah. and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world did what? Wonder oh, after him. So let but let's back up to verse two. And he says there, and the beast which I saw uh, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Interesting characteristics that John is mentioning in the book of Revelation that actually link up to what Daniel said, isn't it? The last phrase is what I want to key on. And the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. So we have this man of sin, which looks like this beast power with the composite image of Daniel 7, but he says the dragon had to give him power. Now, in a primary sense, I read a quote from the Great Controversy uh, in my last presentation. In a primary sense, we know the dragon represents who? Satan. He represents Satan. Satan. But we're told also in a secondary sense that the dragon represents the, the pagan Satan. Roman Empire. Yeah. So if you go back and look at verse 2 of Revelation 13 again, you'll see that not only is it the dragon that gives the beast his power, it is pagan Rome that gives the beast the second phase of this, of this uh, kingdom its power. So once again, even John the Revelator says, oh yes, this kingdom, this Roman Empire will come on the scene in two phases. It will first be pagan, which we've already realized, but he says also it's going to reveal itself in a much terrible form. Okay? And that is what we're going to discover, hopefully, in the next presentation. But before we get there, before we get, uh, if we flip back to Daniel uh, chapter 7, before we get into verse 8 of Daniel 7, which talks about uh, these, these horns and three horns being plucked up, we have to understand, well, how did the horns come to be in the first place? How did the ten horns, because Daniel said at the end of verse 7, and it had ten horns. And so that is what we need to understand before we can talk about the plucking up. We have to uh, also discuss how these horns came to be. And, and when you think about prophecy, uh, once again, we need to define, well, what does a horn mean or represent in prophecy anyway? Well, let's look at a couple of scriptures. What does a horn symbolize? <coughs> Daniel 7, 24. Can someone read that one? And ten horns out of the king, this kingdom are ten horns. <coughs> they sail around. Okay. And another shall ride after them. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten what? Kingdom. So the Bible is letting us know here that a horn represents a what? A king. Okay? So there is one, one definition. Daniel 8.21, and he says there, And the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first what? King. Do we not see uh, clarification there also? Yeah. That the Lord has said, letting us know that these horns represents what? Kings. What else do they represent? This is our scripture uh, that we read today in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18. He says, Then I lift up my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. 
And I said unto the angel that talked to me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the what? Horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and, Ju and Jerusalem. So what is he saying? He said, These are the kingdoms that have worked a, a, a consistently to destroy God's people. So we see in that scripture, uh, hopefully uh, this thing will behave itself, so. we see in that scripture clearly that horns represent not only kings, but they also represent kingdoms. Okay? That they also represent kingdoms. Uh, there are a couple of scriptures that clearly bear this out. When we look at the time of Christ, we know that during his his time in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, that Herod was considered to be the king of Judah. So we know that this pagan Roman Empire and that these horns representing kings or in kingdoms was clearly established with Rome. These ten, these ten horns would eventually uh, represent kingdoms according to these scriptures. So we looked at that, we looked at Daniel, we looked at Zechariah, and the last scripture I want to look at according to Revelation 17, 12, it also says in the ten horns which thou saw are ten kings. So at some point during the reign of the Roman Empire, there would be a transition that takes place. That we would go from this unified Roman uh, kingdom to one that is represented by ten kings that there would be a change in rulership in some way. That in some, at some point, Rome would have to give up power. We saw from those scriptures clearly that a horn in prophecy represents kings or kingdoms. But we also know that while Rome was on the throne, uh, ruling the world, that at some point there had to be a transition that takes place. And so the question is then, what was it that would happen to bring about this transition? Just read it. What was it that occurred that caused this transition? We find the answer to that actually over in, Re in Revelation chapter 8. If you can turn over there. We find the answer to our question of how Rome went from this dreadful and terrible beast to the ten horns in, in Revelation chapter 8. We're told in the great controversy on page 438 as you turn there that uh, it was the, the chief agent of Satan making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire. We, we, we shared how in the last presentation under Nero that Rome would eventually start persecuting Christians mm -hmm. uh, and, and killing them, call, uh, calling on them as being the reason for the fires that destroyed two-thirds of Rome. Mm -hmm. They blamed all the Christians for that. And so they started uh, uh, bringing them in, persecuting them. We looked at scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11 that talked about how they were, they were clothed with goat skins and sheep skins and they were marched out into the theaters and the arenas to be devoured by wild animals. And so this persecution started with Nero and continued. And also in Acts chapter 17 and Acts chapter 19, there were even the heathen that were calling for an end to this Christianity because they were losing prophets. People were converting to create Christianity and they were walking away from all of this idol worship. And so the uh, heathen owners of the shops of Diana and all of these other idol worshipers were complaining to the authorities that look, this has got to stop. We've got to put an end to this Christianity and this following Christ because we're losing money. And so Rome, under the pagan empire, started to persecute God's people. The last quote there, the end of that quote, it says, Thus while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome, because it was pagan Rome 
that started the initial persecution of God's people and would continue to persecute God's people and, and, and shed their blood hoping to destroy as many of them as possible. But we know that this would come to an end because the Lord said that pagan Rome, that Rome would be judged and Rome will have to suffer the results of her attacks on God's people. And we find that in Revelation chapter 8. Interestingly, Daniel just says at the end of verse 7 and Daniel 7 that the dreadful and terrible beast had ten horns. He doesn't talk about how the transition took place. You have to come over to John uh, in, in Revelation to find out how the transition occurs. If you read the interpretation of the seven trumpets of Revelation chapter 8, in those seven trumpets we see the judgment of God upon the pagan Roman Empire. And as these trumpets started to blow, as we see starting with verse 6, the seven trumpets starting to blow, as each trumpet blew, there was an attack on the Roman Empire. This area here compassed the entire Roman Empire all the way out to Great Britain. And as the trumpets blew, one after another, the barbarian tribes that were outside of this territory attacked. Trumpet one blew, there was an attack. Trumpet two blew, there was an attack. There was the Visigoths in trumpet one. We had the Vandals in trumpet two. Vandals, where we get our word vandalism. We had the Huns in the third trumpet, and the Haruli in the fourth trumpet, Islam in the fifth, and the sixth in the seventh trumpet. So the Lord said, Babylon, you will be judged, spiritual Babylon, but he also said, literal Rome, you will be judged. And Rome was judged as a result of the blowing of these trumpets in Revelation chapter 8. Mm -hmm. And so Daniel says, I saw the dreadful beast, and then I saw ten horns, but John says, come over here to Revelation. Let me give you the detail of how Rome transitioned from this dreadful and terrible beast with, with iron teeth and, and brass nails to the ten horns that Daniel saw rising up. And so we see that it took place here according to uh, Revelation chapter 8. And as the attacks continued on one after another, in Daniel chapter 7, he goes on to say, finally, that I saw how many horns? How many horns did Daniel see in chapter 7, verse 7? He said, I saw 10 horns. Did he see 11? No. Did he see 9? No. no. He saw 10 horns. And interestingly, according to the historical account, the Western Roman Empire was broken up into ten parts. Isn't that amazing? We talked about this morning, morning how prophecy is sure, is it not? When the Lord revealed to Daniel that this would take place and there would be ten horns, Daniel had no doubt. He knew that it was a sure word of prophecy, didn't he? Because Jesus Christ revealed it to him. Jesus wanted him to know so that we would know and be prepared for his soon return. Amen? Amen? And so he broke them up into ten pieces. Those seven trumpets of Revelation 8, when they were done blowing, the end result was ten territories. You had the Alemanni, which today we would call Germany, the Ostrogoths. We also had the Visigoths, which today we would call what? Spain. The Burgundians which today are called Switzerland, or the Swiss. We also had the Vandals, and then the Franks, which we call Fr French or France. The Suebes, which are Portuguese or Portugal. The Saxons of England. The Herula, which I mentioned, which was one of those, those trumpets. And the last one, the Lombards, are the Italians. Ten parts, no more, no less. Daniel said there will be ten horns. The Bible says there would be ten territories. Daniel went on to say he saw the feet and the toes of clay and iron. How many toes do we have? Mm -hmm. Only ten toes. Ten toes, ten horns, ten kingdoms. Not eleven, 
and not nine and not eight. The Bible was clear on that point that there would only be ten. Amen? Amen. And so when Daniel saw at the end of chapter seven the ten horns, he's letting us know, okay, we transition. And so in our next presentation, we will look at a little more detail of what happened after the separating of the Roman Empire into ten territories. Because that is when, as Paul said, the mystery of iniquity will be revealed. That is when the man of sin, as Paul said, will be revealed. We had to go through this step so that we can see that the man of sin did not come during the pagan Roman uh, height of strength and power. The man of sin came when? After the ten toes. After Rome was divided into ten sections. Amen? Amen. And so, as we close, I want to take another look back at Daniel chapter 2. Because in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel tried to tell us clearly that this would be the case. He said there would be ten, ten toes. In verse 33, he says his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and clay. And then he goes on in verse 41, and he says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be what? Divided. There are a lot of people that have come along and have attempted to reunite the European nations, have they not? You have the European Union now, but the Lord said they will forever be what? Divided. They will be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with the clay, in verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Uh, the Lord told Daniel, they won't come together again mm -hmm. to be a fierce nation upon this earth. Mm -hmm. There are uh, attempts, as I said, people are making efforts to try to bring these, these, these countries together to reformulate this, this, this power, this authority that they've had in times past. But the Bible said, no. Uh, John 10, 35, the Lord said, the scriptures will not be broken. If the Bible says they won't come together, you can put your money on it, as they said. I'm not saying go betting any money anywhere, but you can guarantee that this will be the case. Napoleon tried to conquest the world. Did he succeed? No, he lost at Waterloo, didn't he? Uh, Charlemagne, Charlemagne came close. He gathered most, most of the territories here in Europe, but he wasn't able to do the entire world. And Charles the, the Fifth and Louis the Fourteenth, all of these men had it in their minds to bring the world back together again, but the scripture will not be broken. Amen? Amen? So we can be assured what God said in his word, what Jesus revealed to Daniel was true, and that it was for our times to help us prepare for his soon return. And in verse 43, And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with clay, uh, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. You know, I took a class when, uh, when I was studying engineering on uh, metallurgy. I don't know if you ever heard of that word. But it's a class where you uh, dig into the details of the properties of metals, uh, talking about the idea of cleaning out impurities in a metal. You know, if you, if you try to forge steel and it had impurities in it, what do you think would happen to that metal over time? It will come apart. It, yes, yes, it will fail. At some point, it will fail. And so in this class, we talked about how you, know, you have to go through a certain process to eliminate these impurities out of metals. And so when you think about iron and clay, I don't know how much you mix it together. Will it ever formulate into something able to, to, to stand the support of any kind of load? No, no. So that's why the Bible says you know, they will mingle with the seed of men, but what will happen? Nothing. They will not come together because iron and clay
do not miss, do they? Yeah. Amen. So the Bible is definitely sure in revealing to us that uh, there would be two parts to this kingdom. The first part was pagan Rome, and we know the second part is soon to come. But we also knew uh, and understand as of today that there must have been a division. There must have been the ten horns that Daniel spoke of prior to the man of sin being revealed, which will be the next presentation. And so at this time, we're going to transition uh, into a uh, moment of testimonials as we reflect back on um, the year past. I want to look at a scripture in Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. I was reading the uh, devotional of Maranatha, and interestingly, at the beginning of the year, it, uh, in the month of January, it focuses on the birth of Christ and the life of Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, I found this scripture to be uh, fitting for uh, our testimonies. And it, and it says there, Hebrews chapter 9, in verse uh, 28, yes, I'm in the wrong place. Okay, so Christ was twice offered. Was he twice offered? Once. He was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. When Jesus was born in the manger, uh, according to the scriptural account, the whole world was looking for him, wasn't it? No. Yeah. Matter of fact, when you read <laughs> the account of Mary and Joseph walking through Bethlehem, they couldn't find a place to turn in. All the inns were full. No one had room for them. And here they were about to, to bring into the world our Savior. But the doors were closed. The people were not looking for him to come. And so the only refuge they could find was where? It was in a state. And so they, they, they sat there ready for the birth of the Son of God in the stable. And the, and the, and the account in the Spirit of Prophecy uh, shared that there were angels uh, that were witnessing this event from afar off. And the angels were uh, in discord in disarray because they saw no one in the town of Bethlehem or anywhere else that were looking for the return of Jesus. And so they were about to return to heaven to give their report that no one was ready to receive the Savior of the world. And so until they looked again and out in the fields, they saw shepherds. And they, they listened in and to their conversation and they saw these shepherds talking about the prophecies of the coming of Christ. And they were, they were joyous to know that, yes, there were some people who were looking for Jesus' for, uh, first coming. I was about to say his return. There were people looking for his first coming, and, but the question bids, are there people looking for his second coming? In the year of 2019, were we looking for the return of Jesus? Were we witnessing and living our lives in a way that indicated that we were assured that we were preparing for the return of Christ? That's the question we must ask ourselves. And so, Tim, if you'd like to come up with me, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to start by offering thanks and praise to the Lord for 2019 for my family and myself, and uh, for the Lord giving us uh, safe passage through this, this previous year. There have been trials and tribulations that I know have come our way in different, in different forms, and uh, we thank the Lord for those, that He has strengthened us, and He has put a hedge about us to make it to the year 2020. I also want to praise Him and ask that he will continue to watch over my family and I, that we will continue to do his will throughout this year, that he will watch over my boys, keep them in school, keep them focused on what they should be, and that he will continue to protect us, Valerie and I, as we uh, continue to raise them 
according to his will. So that is my prayer and thanks for the year 2019 and looking forward to the year 2020. Well, since Joe put me on the spot, um, I want to read this scripture in Isaiah chapter 58, um, verse 13 and 14, as we give thanks to the Lord for last year, and we look forward to uh, rich blessings in 2020, a year of uh, clear vision. It makes me think about uh, Chronicles 2020, where it tells us that there's no vision in the land and people perish, but... Um, Isaiah 58, 13, is this, If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. This scripture is ever um, significant to me because I remember it's like uh, 2012. I, I started searching the scriptures for myself. And uh, I came across Exodus chapter 20 and did not know what a Sabbath was, what a Sabbath meant. Um, and I Googled it, and I found out that there was this group of crazy people that kept the Sabbath. But no, they were, uh, they were different, and I studied, and, and I, I, I started looking for this kind of church. And um, the Lord brought me, and I remember people telling me, man, this is a phase, and nail to the cross, all types of things. Um, you know, God, we're on grace and not the law. Uh, so many things, but through all that, the Lord says, if you will, Turn your foot away from my Sabbath, and that you would follow me not doing your own pleasures or, or seeking your own ways. He says, then will you delight in the Lord. And I can tell you from my personal testimony that coming to this movement, for keeping the Sabbath, from learning to be among God and his people, that I have been blessed. And I delight myself in the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that can't find light. They may have been Christians all their life, but you hear about them commit suicide. You know, they may have been Christian all their life, they're struggling with depression. You know, all these things. But yet and still, God says, if you'll turn to me, he says, I keep him in perfect peace. That's right, he keeps his mind stayed on me. So I just want to thank the Lord for all this time, um, for being a young man, to be able to stand here and minister and to talk with people, uh, to share my faith online, uh, to share my faith at work. And I, they say some places you can't share your faith at work. I said, I'll be fired for a week. I'm going to talk about it. And so um, just thank the Lord for everything he's done. Now, we are one Sabbath closer to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I look forward to great things that he shall be doing. Amen. I pray that we all will continue to be his children. Amen. 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 Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, oh Lord, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day, this first Sabbath of the new year 2020. We thank you for sparing our lives throughout the year past. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we tarry in this land, waiting for your soon and imminent return, that we will continue to reach souls for your kingdom in our witness and in the lives that we live. Father, we pray that the words that we speak to others around us will be uplifting and will draw them closer to you. As we depart from this place, O oh Lord, abide with us, we ask. Keep us safe as you have done in the past. Help us to not, to not be complacent, but to always reach out to you each and every day for guidance, for truth, for understanding, for protection and love. Hear our prayer, we ask in the worthy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.